Galloway's support through sight loss. Galloway's Get Active presents Tony Giles, The Blind Traveller. Okay, so joining us this week, we've got Tony Giles, who's um, the blind backpacker. Is that correct, Tony? You're, yeah. Uh, and I think yeah, your, your aim in life, Tony, is to visit every country in the world unaided. Yeah, it's so, yeah, my basic goal. So if, if you'd like to tell us, start off a little bit about yourself, Tony, and how you, how you came along with this, this goal of visiting every country. Yeah. Um, so my name is Tony. I'm currently 42 years old. Um, you can all hear me okay, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I currently live in a small seaside town called Timmouth in Devon, uh, where the sun always shines. Um, I originate from Western Sea from Air, um, but I lived in lots of different places around the UK. Um, I was born with a rare eye condition called cone dystrophy and photophobia, which basically means my eyes were sensitive to bright light and I'm missing my colour nerves. Um, but because I got my rods, I was extremely sensitive to light as a baby. So, um, so although in theory I could see light and shadows, because it was because my eyes were so sensitive, I couldn't open my eyes for basically the first three years of my life. So I was basically technically born blind. And once I was given dark glasses, I was about three years old. I was able to run around, and I had a, an older brother and an older sister. They weren't blind or had any visual problems. So my mum realised I wasn't any different to them, but I needed to get educated. So once I had dark glasses, I could run around the street and pick a football. And I was um, I had this really big three-wheel bike I sort of rode around the street on and crashed in the walls and lampposts and apparently caused mayhem and chaos. So um, when I was five, um, I went to a, a day school. Um, about 20 miles from my home, I go there by taxi every day. Um, so that was kind of my first sort of first introduction to any kind of travel or adventure. Um, I also went deaf, partially deaf in both ears when I was four or five. Um, I just given basic uh, basic hearing aids and got on with it. Um, because my eyes were so sensitive to light and shadow, I could detect um, the shapes of black lines on white paper really sharply. So I learned to um, read and write, I learned the alphabet and the letters. Um, and I did this until I was sort of eight, nine and 10. About, about the age of nine and 10, my light sensitivity was going. And my eye condition never changed because it can't, but my sensitivity had lessened. I'd start looking at objects and stuff. So I was basically uh, needed another school to educate me. So at the age of 10 and a half, I got sent to Coventry literally. Um, I went to a boarding school there called Exel Grange and that's why I learned Braille, reading and writing Braille, learned mobility. I never, I never knew what a, cane, a long cane was till I went there. So I'd, I'd spent all my life running around, just playing with my friends, following sounds um, and sort of picking up spatial awareness, which is apparently something I was born with. I was just always spatially aware. When I was running around on my bike, I knew where I could sense where lampposts were and walls were, even though I couldn't really see them. I wasn't really watch, sure what I could see or what I couldn't see. But anyway, I was at boarding school. Um, I got mobility training and then got to learn how to get around the school campus and the fields. And, and then eventually um, at the local area, and I learned to go to the local shops. And by the age of sort of uh, 14, 15, I've been able to catch buses and then uh, eventually catch trains to go home to see my family. So my first sort of immediate thing was what I wanted to do was when I was at boarding school, it was a good four or five hours from my home was um, go home and see my family. So I never had sort of any big ideas about traveling uh, when I was sort of that age. I was more interested in sort of playing and mucking about and picking a ball. But um, I slowly got introduced to geography. Um, and we had tactile globes and tactile maps. Um, we were, everything made of different textures and that. So that was sort of in my initial introduction to the world and 
a bigger place. And also my dad, who was in the Merchant Navy before I was born, he told me about his adventures going across Australia uh, by train from East Coast to West Coast, took him eight days. And he described icebergs floating down the St. Lawrence River going past the ship at night. So that kind of intrigued me and little books I was starting to read at school and listen to. And that was, um, but uh, my first sort of introduction to real travel, um, apart from a couple of holidays with my parents, was um, I got the opportunity to go to Boston in the States with my school when I was 16. Uh, we were studying about the uh, Salem witchcraft trials. So, um, and actually going over there for me with other um, blind and visually impaired kids was totally different. I've been to London a few times and a couple of other big cities, Birmingham and that, but going to America was completely different. Everything was much bigger. I could sense the space, you know, the, the, the pavements and that. And, People talked in funny accents I couldn't understand and people were more direct. I, I had someone come up to me and say, are you blind? I said, uh, oh yeah, it's like 16 year olds and um, traffic went in a different direction, which was sort of confusing. Obviously I could hear it all and that. And I don't know, I just sensed an atmosphere on the street. It was different to the UK. People were different. I remember having a state one night and the state was huge. It filled the entire place. It was like, you know, it's about the size of two meals I'd normally eat in England. So it was very different. Um, then I, I, oh, I like this. I want more of this. So that sort of could have pricked my um, notion of traveling. And then um, uh, one of my schoolmates has got sight in one eye. Um, sort of introduced me to, to backpacking around England and staying in hostels and camping. So, you know, I was a typical teenager into doing all that kind of stuff then. And I've been camping with my family. So learn how to put a, put a tent up by hand. And, and then um, that was the kind of the start of it. And then um, my mate introduced me to hosteling, where it's just, just, just stay in a room of six beds, eight beds with strangers from different places. And that's sort of, I sort of, sort of started to learn about traveling and other cultures and that. And I remember me, uh, First time I actually went back packing with my friend, we uh, we went out to Norwich for the weekend to, uh, to go to a rock gig, and uh, we got to this hostel and uh, we may managed to find out how to get to it. And we uh, we checked in, we dumped our bags on a bed, and then we we uh, got the bus into the city and where I found out where this concert was. And then we uh, after the gig about eleven o'clock at night, my mate said, "Right, we'll walk back." <laughs> Well, this is good. In a city we don't know, <laughs> one eye between us. I said, yeah, yeah, we'll walk back. So we did. Naturally, we got lost. And eventually, we managed to get a taxi and took us back to the hostel. And um, the owner had left the door open for us so we could get in. And we went out to our room and we had a key each. And we both tried the door. <laughs> we couldn't open the door. So we tried it about ages. And eventually, we just said, oh, stuff this. So we managed to find another room that was open and just sort of crashed on two empty beds. And then the next morning, the owner managed to uh, get in through the window, <laughs> open the door, and we managed to get our stuff and leave. So that was <laughs> that was my kind of introduction to hostling. And um, I've kind of been doing it ever since, really. And then um, from that, I sort of continued traveling around the UK and going to gigs and concerts. And then um, I wanted to go back to the States. So just before I, um, well, I finished my GCSEs, I was going to go to um, study in Hereford, do my A-levels at uh, RNC College. And my mate said, oh, let's go to the States a couple of weeks. So we planned it. I did most of the planning. I was using the internet and my laptop computer with a speech software. And um, we booked a couple of hostels in New York and one in Washington. And we went over there. and. I had great fun. Um, I only got arrested uh, trying to feel up the uh, Lincoln Memorial and this security guard said, stop, don't move, turn around. And I turned around, I had my white cane in my hand and said, oh, you're blind, I said, okay. <laughs> so we thought we were gonna get arrested, but we didn't. And then on a, another occasion, we were uh, in New York and we were um, we were on the uh, on the subway, on the underground train and it, we were in uh, one of the sort of end carriages and we just coming into the station and we, we mate suddenly realised um, the 
the trains were going to be short of the platform when we were in a carriage, we didn't know to get off. So we were running through the carriages, sort of pushing these sliding doors open to get from one coach to another. And uh, <clears throat> I was on the couplings when I slipped, one of my legs went between the car two carriages. And uh, my mate's trying to pull me up. And luckily we we're on a bend. And just before the train straight, he managed to pull me up as I've probably got my leg cut off. So they were sort of a couple of, a couple of uh, sort of early incidences to my travels. And then um, I went back and did my A-levels, uh, history, maths, and um, biology, I think it was. And then I went off to uni. I started to do an American studies degree because um, I thought that'd be different. And also the course came with the uh, five months in the States. Um, I thought, oh, that'd be fun. That'd be different, learn about a culture and life. So in 2000, I went off to uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and it was completely different. It was, people talk very, very strange, funny accents and strange food. I had a, something called grits every day with every meal, a bowl of grits. And I can only describe this as kind of like gray sand. Someone told me that's what it looked like. And it tasted gritty as well. And you'd have this with breakfast, lunch, and dinner in South Carolina and Texas and other places. Um, it was quite weird. I'd say it's an acquired taste. And it's basically, um, what is it? It's crushed corn. And sometimes you have it with butter. And some people put sugar in it. Um, that was weird. Um, and lots of fried chicken and pork and iced tea, of course. So. And it was, it was while I was studying in the States. Um, I was fantastic over there because um, when I was studying in England, I had, I had been sponsored, given some money to get me a, a computer and have it. I went to the States and the university, they had everything. They had um, scanners, talking scanners. They had people to read books to me, audio, um, so much equipment. And so it was fantastic studying there. And then um, during spring break, which is sort of mid late April, all my friends decided they go down to Florida for a week to see Disney World and Mickey Mouse. And I was 21 at this point, and I was a party animal, drinking all the time and stuff. And I thought they're not going to let me drink a party, so I thought I'll plan a trip to New Orleans by myself. I heard of New Orleans and at the jazz and the blues, and thought that'd be fun. So I got um, one of the staff members to help me book a flight and booked a hostel and someone gave me a ride to the airport. And then when I got to New Orleans, I just um, you know, took a taxi to the hostels. That was fairly straightforward. And I thought, well, this is no different to what I've been doing in England, um, except the heat was a lot worse. So I um, went in the hostel, introduced myself and checked in. And then I uh, went and asked one of the staff, oh, how do I get to Bourbon Street, which is like the main party town, the main party street and bars and clubs. And we said, oh, well, you Got out of the hostel, walk down the steps, turn left, go up the street four blocks, uh, you find a tram stop, uh, get on the tram, go down to Bourbon. So, okay, that's straightforward. Street's all fairly straight uh, in New Orleans. I walked down the steps and stood on the pavement, and then it suddenly hit me. It must have been about 30 degrees Celsius and probably 98% humidity, so I was sweating like a pig already. And I just felt this fear hit me inside and started shaking. And I just thought to myself, I'm totally blind, severely deaf, in a foreign dangerous city I'd never been to before. I can't do this. This is, how am I going to get around? I'm going to find a tram stop. So I took a few deep breaths and I said, Tony, this is what you want. This is what you're coming to do. And if you don't want to do it, go home. So I took a few more deep breaths right I can do this turn left walk four blocks found someone who showed me the tram stop when the tram came jumped on said Bourbon Street please all stops later someone said Bourbon Street I got off I headed to a few bars heard some jazz some blues had an absolute whale of a night and I've been traveling ever since um, yeah uh, so um, how many countries have you been to, Tony, so far? Um, so now I've been to 140, did you do, 142 countries. 
and all 50 US states and all seven continents of the world. And I guess it was at that point after I sort of experienced that feeling in New Orleans and I went on to travel around California and ended up in Hawaii in that same year, I sort of realized I can do this by myself. And this is what I want to do, this is what I enjoy, smelling the elements, hearing all the different noises, meeting different people from different backgrounds. And I thought, yeah, I can do this. And this is, this is, this is my passion. And then I realized, well, wow, I've been to so many countries. Why don't I try and visit everyone in the world? Very good. So which, which would you say is your favorite you've been to so far? Uh, New Zealand is the best country I've been to. Um, the first time I went there, I was 21, 22, and I spent three months there drunk on a bus. <laughs> As they got these uh, Kiwi experience buses that go around the country, and they sort of drop you off in different uh, destinations, and you can get on the same bus the next day, and sort of, you know you can meet the same with the people you meet, or you can stay a few days at each destination, and you just ring them and say, oh, I'm ready to go on now, and then they organise your accommodation for you, or sort of back backpacker style accommodation or camping and the other thing I thought was good for me was was they organize activities so they said oh send a list around of about 30 people on the bus so who wants to do a bungee jump and didn't really know what that was but yeah put my name down for it so I was pretty young and wild then and of course having no sight it's like the idea of sort of jumping off some bridge into nothing that kind of appealed to me I can't really explain why but it just did and I, you know, I ended up doing six of them. And then I did something called Zorbing as well. I basically put you in a big plastic beach ball or football and um, with water, if you want, and roll you down a big hill. And I thought, that sounds like fun. <laughs> so I did that once. Um, but I complained. I said, the hill's not steep enough. I want a bigger hill. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's doing all these crazy things and drinking, you know, 10, 12, 15 pints a night. And, meeting girls and other people and it was just just a young person's dream really and then I went back to New Zealand um three years ago four years ago with my girlfriend who's also blind and um we did it on sort of a more gentle trip just in North Island we went to a place called Rotorua in the middle of the North Island and it's all full of um natural um thermal hot springs and stuff and you can smell it everywhere and it just stinks like okay. poo, obviously. That was quite amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah, New Zealand's amazing. Turkey, um, Indonesia. Um, I like Indonesia, all the different islands, and different culture. Um, and also Brazil and Japan. I went to Japan, the most amazing food I've ever eaten. There's so many different sort of textures in one little dish. And um, we went to a, a vegetarian restaurant one night and with some friends we've met and um, they brought out about 10 different little dishes and each dish had about five or six textures. We couldn't pronounce the name of any of them, but and that was pretty amazing. And um, the first time I went to Brazil, um, went to this restaurant, instead of like normally you go to a restaurant and you order your food wouldn't and pay for it afterwards, maybe, you know, whatever. In, um, in Brazil, they have these buffet restaurants and you go in and you put as much on your plate and then they weigh it and you pay the price of your, uh, the weight of your plate. So that, that was different. Mm. And then eventually I went off to Africa. I spent some time in South America and I went off to Africa and that was incredible. It was the most amazing traveling I'd done because you got so many challenges. You got the heat and the dryness, um, the dust, all the time, you got public transport, and it'd be, you know, imagine a 15, 20 seater minibus and there's 35 people on it, plus the luggage, plus live animals. First time I got on a bus, I was in uh, Mozambique and I certainly heard this chicken going, black, 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 black. All oh, right, what's that? And chicken was on the bus with us. And then I heard this noise thumping on the top of the roof. I said, oh, what's that to someone? Said, oh, they're just tying their local goat, uh, taking it to market. So this is unbelievable. And then you got the music booming loud, boom, 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 and the bass. And this whole minibus is rocking, and sort of squashed between four people for about four hours. This <laughs> is just, just quite remarkable. Uh, yeah. yeah. But shall we ask people if they've got any, any questions for you, Tony? Totally? Yeah, yeah, it's far away. Anyone got any questions then? You can unmute yourselves now, one at a time. 
do you work for a living or how do you pay for all these holidays? Ah, yes. I thought someone had asked that. Um, my, dad left, my dad left me a private pension. When he died, he worked for the railway when I was 17. So I used that to travel. And then I used my hip um, to pay my rent and stuff. And then I save up and then I try and travel for as cheap as possible. Um, so it's a long time I used hostels, which are quite cheap. Um, and then I've now discovered a website called Couchsurfing, where you can find local people online and go and stay with them for free. And you just offer to pay for coffee or something or take them for a meal. Um, and once you get to like South America and Africa, the transportation is quite cheap, they're very cheap. So that's how I kind of do it. It's basically the, the, the most expensive then is the, the flight out of the UK, I'm guessing. Yeah, usually, unless you go to somewhere like Japan or Norway, where everything's expensive, then yeah, once you, once you sort of land in a country, my first country, and then I'll, I'll travel four or five, three or four four months, and I'll just cross borders, land borders. So that makes it a lot cheaper. And then I've also um, published a couple of um, books online. Um, I try and make a bit of money from them. And I also was lucky enough to make a couple of documentaries with the BBC Travel Show in the last couple of years. So oh, like, yeah, I remember that when yeah. you were in Jerusalem. Yeah. So I get pocket money for that. Hmm. And my parent, my family have helped me out here and there. But yeah, I mostly sort of use my dad's pension and then uh, the benefits will be PIP. Yeah. So, I, I mean, myself question I was going to ask. I, I do understand your problem of hearing foreign voices. Um, I was a bit surprised when I was in America uh, that I had to run my hearing aids two decibels higher uh, <laughs> than normal. Yeah, everybody speaking English, you know, uh, because they speak a lot faster. You wouldn't think you'd yeah. have a problem hearing when it's all uh, English anyway. Yeah. It can be, you know, so... Yeah. But you think you think it's all English and then you get there and it's a different type of English. And then you get somewhere like, especially in some of the rural places in South Carolina and Tennessee, yeah. and it's it's not only the English, it's the accent as well, and it's the twang. And uh, yeah, it yeah. is like a yeah. it's like a foreign language. And then you've got, you know, bits of African dialect thrown in and Spanish as well. So it's <laughs> Oh certainly Spanish, definitely. I, I certainly know there's parts of America that speak Spanish. Because, yeah. of, because of its history. Um, yeah. Which brings me to the other point. Well, you said you've stayed uh, with other families abroad as well as in hostels. I think yeah. I remember seeing you on a slot somewhere in Africa on, on, on a TV travel program. Yeah, it was Ethiopia, yeah. Um, do they not get a bit surprised to find out that one of their visitors are taken in is visually impaired and deaf? Because obviously it might not necessarily say so on their paperwork. Oh. Yeah, they, they do get they do find it a bit shocking. <laughs> um, yeah, so people ask me, oh, why are you traveling? Why are you coming to visit my country? You can't mm. see. What's the point? And I sort of explain to them, well, it's you know, it's not just about seeing the look vistas, it's about meeting the people and talking, you know, and you don't need to see to talk to someone, do you? So you know, it's the whole cultural experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, like it the is. Smells, the taste and everything else, haven't you? Sorry? You've got the sight, the smell, the taste. The, That's it, um, the music. Yeah. <clears throat> you know. I bet, I bet you get treated um, a lot better, like you do in England, if you've got a white stick. I mean, we went to Malta, and one of the guys said to me, make sure you take your white stick. He said, because you'll get loads of respect if you walk around with your white stick. And it was amazing. <laughs> it just cut the crowds in half and everything. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the hospitality and kindness I've had shown to me around the world is is overwhelming. It's just people want to take me home and, um, when you know, when refuse to take me money when I try to buy them a meal and that. It's just, yeah, they just, yeah. it's just like they sort of want to protect you and you see you're blind and <laughs> wandering around. They, they just worry you're going to get run over or kidnapped or something. Oh, that's just, it, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good I'm thing. I'm very lucky. But once they know you're blind, you do get a hell of a lot more help than a sighted person would. Yeah, you get away with a lot more as well. Oh, I. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> we had to, read the, we had to read the book to find out about that. Nothing like you. And the thing I found was like I went abroad on holidays, um, like to the States or Cuba, places like that, is people see me wandering around the hotel and using my white stick and you, you sense that they're looking at you and then you start going on some of the excursions like the snorkeling trips or the jeep safaris and all, all things like that. Mm. And you find the following night something when you're in the bar, people start coming up to you and says, oh, I was on that, that same trip that you went to and I, I thought it was amazing being, not saying in a pattern <laughs> or anything, but amazing at the sort of things that you can do when you can't see that well. Yeah. For me, it's sort of, um, it's something I like to do is to, to go to regular hotels instead of ones that are specifically for people with a sight loss. And yeah. It's a way of, for me, kind of spreading the word that, you know, well, okay, we haven't got, we can't see as well as, as everybody else, but it doesn't stop us doing anything else. No, I could do it's a way of kind of educating other people, I think. So that's it. Yeah, I think we're sort of well. We had to do in Spain, didn't we, James? When some of them went on that banana boat, that the people were a bit reluctant to take you, weren't they? Well, yeah. you with us, we were, we were, you know, and it's sad. well, you, you you capsized, didn't you? All of you capsized, but you managed to get it all upright. Yeah, yeah. well, it's like when we went to Turkey as well, we went on the jeep safaris and on all them sorts of things. So. Ah. But we're just normal people like anyone else. It's just, you know, our eyes don't work. But our brain does, you know, so. Tony, um, can I ask you a health-related question? Sorry, yeah. It, it's Kay. Um, Hi. In all these countries you've been to, the hygiene will not have been quite to our standard everywhere. How have you got on with uh, tummy bugs and various infections? Uh, tried not to catch any. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a quick answer um i um obviously take uh, inoculations i can um i i had to get yellow fever um to talk to a lot of the african countries um things like that so i get my inoculations and then um um drinking bottled water avoiding not drinking tap water um i try to avoid salad I don't like salad anyway, but, um, because of what it washed in and fruit, uh, eating fruit, peel fruit. Um, trying to sort of eat with local people. Um, I do like to try the local foods, but eating street food can be a bit dodgy. Um, uh, so I try and find out the national dish of each country I go to. So obviously I can't pick a menu up read through it so no no things like that and obviously with a lot of the countries i go to don't speak the language so i try and learn um you know, basic hello thank you water toilet sort of crucial words um but yeah um and also uh, what i didn't say is um i also was um discovered i had kidney disease in uh when i was in 2002 uh, i eventually had a kidney transplant so that oh. makes, yeah, that makes health travel a bit more uh, an issue for me, potentially. Um, oh. But such luck, I've only had diarrhea a couple of times. And um, yeah, um, but I do have to be careful. And the water is the biggest issue, um, tap drinking mm. water. Um, On a practical... I think that's standard issue to where you go, isn't it, though? Don't drink the water. Sorry? I mean... Um, do you not have to carry a certificate if you've had the yellow fever injection? Yeah, so you um you get a yellow fever, at, um, mm. you get a document once you've had it. And, um, oh, right. It, 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 it used to only be um, value for 10 years, um, but now the uh, World Health Organization said it's valued for life. Mm. Uh, but some African countries only accept it for 20 years. Oh. Um, and in my case, because yellow fever is a live vaccine, I can't have oh. another. I can't have another vaccine. Um, I've heard that for somebody who's got kid. Uh, somebody that that came to light because of COVID nineteen. I know somebody else who's got uh, who's had a, a transplant and was told uh, told me that this. She told me she couldn't have um, a live vaccine, and that'll affect those needing COVID nineteen ones now. It might know. do, depending if it's a live vaccine or not. I don't know much about it at the moment. 
No, but yeah, no. Um, but I have, I have also heard that um, they're trying to develop uh, medication for people who've got um, uh, low immune systems. So that might mm. be another option. Um, but yeah, most of, every time you get an inoculation in the UK, they write it in a book. So you just take them with you and show them at borders. Um, mm. And most of the time, they don't have a yellow fever anyway. Um, but yeah, you need a, you, you don't take the real thing, you take a copy. Um, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't, yeah, yeah. So. so day to day practicalities talk. How do you, how do you cope or manage with um, currency? I just spend it. Um, yeah, so <laughs> currency can be an issue. Obviously, we know the UK pounds are different sizes and the euros are different sizes. So they're fairly easy. Um, but US dollars are a mm. hell of a hassle because they're all the same yeah. size. Yeah. Um, nice same color, apparently. So um, it boils down to trust. I have to trust people, um, which obviously I've been doing all my life. So um, when I'm abroad, I have got to find someone to help uh, trust, to help me use a cash machine, an ATM machine. So in oh, the States, yeah. I'll, get, I'll get out $100. And most of the time, that'll be five $20 notes. Um, it almost usually is. And then I'll, I'll find someone in the hostel or someone I'm staying with, and I'll talk to them and listen to them and think, well, I can trust this person. They're not going to steal me money and run off of it. And then, obviously, if I go in a shop and something say $16, uh, $15, I'll hand over a 20 and then hopefully the person behind the till should give me either give me a one note which should be five dollars or five ones now that five dollar note could be a one dollar note and i wouldn't know the difference mm -hmm. but, but usually in shops and that there's so many people around uh, it doesn't happen but um i have had occasions in the states where um i stayed in a hostel and they wanted a uh, a deposit for the keys and obviously if i lose the keys they got to pay to get new ones so i stayed in a hostel once they wanted ten dollars for the keys i handed over ten and I bought, I bought the keys back two days later and asked for my money back and he gave me a note and I assumed it was a 10 and I, uh, I got a taxi and went to the, the bus station and as I was paying the taxi driver, this note I had, I said, hang on, I said it was $8 or whatever and I gave it and he said, hang on, man, that's a one and I thought, oh, shit, oh. Yes. I've been, I've been screwed. Oh. But, you know, it happens, oh. it's life, it can happen in this country, can't it? Well, yeah, but I, I've yeah. had it, 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 yeah, it can. Well, I had it in America when I didn't get me, me change back and somebody in our group said, oh, they'd probably keep it as a tip. I know in America they are particular about tips in restaurants and cafes. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, and I didn't get me change back. You know, I think I was owed something like $5 yeah. change. And they kept me $5 change. I wasn't impressed about it because <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say the service was anything special yeah. at that point. Fact, I ended up so, with diarrhea the day after. Yeah. I think, I think the, key, the key is it with foreign currency, and I've had, you know, I've been in Africa and I've had four or five, six different currencies on me. It's just, it got me organized and put each sort of currency in a different part of my wallet. I also use a money belt, which I put under my clothes and my passport goes in that, so less chance of being robbed. I always keep my money and my passport on me 24 7 when I'm traveling. I'm just mm. trying to be organized and you know, you've got to ask people you think you can trust. How much, what's this note? How much have I got? And I try and keep my hand out how much I spend and how much I've got left. And then, you know, I travel, travel with two or three different debit cards. So I've got backups. And then, um, you know, if you really get a problem, uh, I've had situations in Africa and South America where the debit cards stop working or a cash machine's eating the card and the card's been damaged. And, the fallback is to get me money to send me money through Western Union. And, um, you know, that's a backup. Um, so, yeah, mm. there's, there's always ways around everything. And, and then people say, well, what do you do when you go to a country where you don't speak the language? Well, so I say, well, um, I can get the, the people in the hostel or hotel I'm staying with to write down directions in the, the local language. And then I always take an address card so I know where I'm staying. If I really get oh, stuck, I, I can just shout taxi. You know, it's a uni universal word taxi and they'll take me back to where I'm staying. So it's just sort of learn as I've gone on. I didn't know all this when I started and I made lots of mistakes. And as you get older and you travel more, you learn, you know, what, what to do and what not to do and then try and make backup plans and that. You know. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. Are, are you going to write every event? a book? Sorry? I say, are you going to write a book with all these tips in? You know, I'm just thinking um, of other people who want to. I'm just about to. to I'm just about to publish my third book, uh, oh. third ebook, e third ebook um, yeah. about my first travels into Africa. So yeah, there's bits of tips and that in each book. Really. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, have you tried using Be My Eyes? Because that could help you with your money. Say that again, sir. Have you tried using the Be My Eyes app? Because you I don't, I don't, I don't use it. I don't, I don't use apps. Oh right. <laughs> I'm a bit of a technological dinosaur. Um, oh yeah. right. I don't use iPhones. Um, ah. uh, yeah, any of that. Um, ah. I know. Um, Gosh, how can I you travel without an iPhone? <laughs> Quite easily. <laughs> um, I was traveling. I was traveling before iPhones were invented. In yeah. the good old days, yeah. back in the late nineties, a lot of it. A lot of it goes about the word of mouth and asking people. Um, I take my laptop with me now when I travel, but a lot of the times when you're in little villages in Africa, there's no electricity. No, oh, that's how I wonder. How did you go on with that? No electricity. It's fine. Yeah. It, when the lights go out, I carry on eating. Everyone else stops. <laughs> <laughs> they tell me the lights are gone out. I said, and. Yeah, get out the candles. You know, there's, there's ways yeah. around yeah, everything. Yeah, you have to carry candles. Yeah, you know. Um, I know it's hard for a lot of people to phone. They couldn't live without the phone, but to me, and also they also if it some of a lot of the countries I go to are not particularly safe. Um, someone's, you know, hundred quid iPhone or <laughs> it's the first thing they nick. Um, yeah. Well, that is a point. Mm, yeah. You know, I've had a laptop stolen in Cape Verde. I've had cameras taken. I was in a church in uh, Bulgaria and I asked the guy to take a photo of me in the entrance and he walked off, he walked off at the camera. <laughs> oh, oh. oh dear. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but for me, it just, I just look at it. It's like, well, that's, that's the chance I take. I'm out there, I'm doing it and these things can happen, you know. But then I've met people who've been stabbed and been shot and they got full sight and full hearing. And I just think, well, it's not happened to me. So, and I always think the good outweighs the bad. <laughs> but I love it. Yeah, yeah, understand that. But you know, I, I, I travel a sort of an extreme way. People don't have to travel like I do and still go on holidays and do it a more safer way and still enjoy it. There's so many different options out there, so many different ways of traveling. Uh, mm. I've met people with lots of different disabilities. I met a guy in Africa who drove a, an adapted truck. He got no um, no legs. Mm. And I met another lady with motor neuron disease traveling. And, uh, met, I met a comedian, or a guy trying to be a comedian with only one eye. So. Mm. Yeah. From, from the countries you visited then, Tony, which would you say was the most uh, visually impaired friendly? <laughs> with, regard, um, with regards to the way things are set up, you know, Braille. Yeah, well, the Lord. UK, um, and what's great about the UK, I think, is, you know, when you travel on a train, you can book assistance. Uh, you phone up and, you know, you get assistance, they'll put you on the train, meet you at the it's not, yeah, full, yeah. not perfect, but it does work, I think, mm -hmm. reasonably well. The cell with the underground, mm -hmm. you just walk up to an underground barrier and the staff will take you down, meet you, and that works, you know, nine times out of ten. And if you research it, there's a lot of places in the UK, you've got audio guides, you know, West Westminster Abbey, St Paul's Cathedral, some of the castles, fantastic audio guides and lots of things like that. Um, um, yeah, I said abroad, I would say New York City is probably the easiest city to get around um, oh. if you're blind. Manhattan, oh, most, right. most, yeah, because oh. it's on a grid system. So you know what a, a grid looks like in your mind, but you just count streets and they're all numbered. Yeah. And you just ask people, what street am I on? And they'll tell you at the corner, they'll tell you the street on your right and the street in front of you. Then you can work out whether you're going uptown or downtown just by the numbers. And the same oh, as you. That's where the phrase, the, the phrase downtown has come from. Yeah. And the same if you right. use the subway, if you use the underground, 
you can hear the announcements. You know, if you're going uptown or downtown, you know, if you're going to 34th Street, 42nd Street. It, it, Plus the underground know. on one level, not like London. London, the pain you neck at underground. Uh, yeah, it's, well, I think the underground fairly easy, to be honest. But yeah, the, the, the subway in New York's even better. Oh, yeah, but it's all on one level there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, mostly. Uh, but yeah, I mean, walking around, I don't find New, York, New York's almost all the new, uh, well, Manhattan's flat, so mm. some, some of it. So I, I found, I would say that's the easiest city. I mean, there are some parts that are difficult, but for the main part, it's just you're walking straight lines. Um, Melbourne, parts of Melbourne's like that as well in Australia. Oh, yeah. Semi good system. Mm. Philadelphia as well. Philadelphia is even smaller. Um, so London is more difficult to walk around because it's <laughs> streets go off everywhere and that. Mm. I know the, the mm. first time I went back to the states after after my site went and I was using I was using a white stick. And I went into a bar. My, my stick was folded up because I was I was there with one of my, my American mates. Walked into a bar. My stick was on the on the top of the bar. And the first thing that came up to was oh. What have you brought your drumsticks for? <laughs> it's like, oh, it's, it's like they, they just uh, 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 using salt uh, uh, They haven't got a clue. Yeah. But uh, I mean, fair uh, enough, it was all folded up and everything. But <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, I got asked. I got asked by a couple of Australian guys who was hanging out in a bar with them and said to them, "So, how did, how did the guide dog know where it's going?" I said, "Well, it reads the map before we go out, doesn't it?" <laughs> yeah, you, get, you get all sorts. Yeah, yeah, uh, that is a misconception, or even in England, you know, people think guide dogs have got traffic sense when they haven't. No. Number sense when they haven't. No. Well, what's pe what's in people's minds, isn't it? And they can only imagine. They can only very difficult to you know comprehend if you never lost your sight. I, th I think okay. you did know, though, one of the, the big helpers for your travel is that having that spatial awareness as well and, yeah. and, know, and knowing where you are once you've been somewhere and being able to get back. Yeah. To I've always had that and I've always been able to use the sun, a little bit of sense sensitive. I was able to use the sun, and at least I you knew, I, you know, the sun was in the west or the east. So I have that as well, but I just born with this, this sort of compass inside me, really. Yeah. That helps a lot. Because you can you can get some people, I've, I've seen it myself, where they'll, they'll get out of the car, walk around the car, and they've not a clue where they are. Yeah. All, all they've done is walk around, walk around yeah. and go to the next, and it's like, yeah. I'm at the front, I'm at the back, which side do I get in, and things like yeah. that. You know, and you get people, you're asking people for directions, and they're saying going left, well, they mean they're going right, because they're looking at you. Yeah. You know, my, brain, my brain's able to oh. just work it out quickly. I don't know how, but it's just, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you can still get lost on a grid because I was looking to go to somewhere for evening dinner once, and I thought, uh, I thought, right, I could get lost, but I was also more concerned of the distances because places like the United States, I'm well aware that your distances between places, even within a town, can be three times, four times more than in England. Oh yeah. And yeah. You don't want to. You don't. You don't want to be walking blocks in Washington, D.C. You know. Yeah. So. I think mean, uh, one of the other countries I was going to say, which is quite good up for blind people, is Japan. And Tokyo is ah. amazing. Um, it helps if you can speak Japanese. But um, like if you buy a, a washing machine or a dishwasher or uh, a microwave in Japan, it all comes with Braille on it already. Oh, really? I was, I'm out, yeah. Already? Comes, already? It, comes with braille on. I presume it tells you how to use it. <laughs> I wouldn't know, but it's Japanese braille. But yeah, I found that amazing. And then they got they got the tactile lines on the streets and that in Japan, which is quite helpful, especially in the undergrounds when you're you know you're sort of moving with sort of twenty million people <laughs> at once. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I found Champ Japan quite good, and people there very helpful. They sort of go out their way to help you get from A mm -hmm. to B. Very polite. Mm. Yeah. Once we're allowed to travel again, where would where would you say your next port of call is going to be, or would like to be? Uh, well, excluding Greece, where my partner lives, 
Um, I'm hoping to go to, uh, what's it called? Uh, Bangladesh, India, Bhutan, and Nepal. Oh, wow. Roughly in that order. And that's, <laughs> where, I was, that's where I was meant to be going last March. And oh. then uh, Bhutan got locked down. I paid for a trip to go to Bhutan. I got a I'm guide. I'm surprised. Because you can only You're get in. Like it'd be small. You can only you can only get into Bhutan with a guide. Oh. Maybe it has to be, yeah, maybe it has to be right. organised. Um, I was about to go, and they said, "Don't go because we'll lock you up for two weeks." <laughs> but okay. <laughs> oh. So I went. I went to Botswana instead, and then I got stuck in Southern Africa because they closed all the borders with COVID. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's where I go next, hopefully, sort of maybe March, April. So it just there, depends. Are there any countries that you've, you've already been to that were, shall we say, really difficult to get into? Get into? Um, yeah, getting a visa for... Um, getting a visa for Sudan was tricky. Um, oh. Basics, I tried to do it on the ground rather than go to an embassy in Sudan here. I did it in Egypt. And oh. that got more complicated because I was blind. And then my host I was going to stay with in Sudan wasn't actually in Sudan. That got more complicated. Um, and then we had a problem with the person who, was at, who had to actually um, agree to grant the visa wasn't there on the day. And you can't just like go to the embassy every day. And uh, there were certain times when you could go as a foreign tourist and certain times you could go as an Egyptian tourist to get a visa. And then you stand in long lines. And of course, I don't speak Arabic. So yeah. Um, oh. And I had lots and lots of problems in, that was in Cairo. And I managed to resolve the problem eventually. So well, at one point I told I couldn't go at all. It was too dangerous. And I wanted this amount of money and all the, I went down to um, a swan in the south of Egypt and they didn't ask any questions. They filled a friend, filled a form in for me. I paid me money is 150 pounds and I got the visa within three days. Um, but yeah. So they were interested in the money on that one by the sound of it. Partly money and partly the issues of being blind <laughs> and yeah. And because so who's going to look after you and all this stuff. Um, also, Azerbaijan, when I was in Georgia, Georgia who was about oof, 10 years ago, eight years ago, um, I went to the embassy, Azerbaijan embassy, and they said, um, oh, no, I'm going to cross the land border. Um, and they said they wouldn't give me a visa because there's no one to look, to look after me. And how could I speak the language? And I was blind. Yeah. So, so. I just thought, well, it's your loss of £100. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I've had a bit, uh, trying to get into where was it? Senegal. Um, I had to pay um, the border security guard a bribe to get my passport back. Um, yeah, yeah, getting visas in Africa can be quite a challenge for anyone if you're white. Uh, if you're white, they see you as uh, money. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, the yeah. Same right. way it's more of a bribe, isn't it? Yeah. That's to be done as a That's bribe. A isn't it? If someone's got your passport, what can you do? You can't go. Mm. You haven't got your passport. You can't go anywhere. Yeah. So you. Um, yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, I suppose the least the least favourite country I've been to, um, Italy. Um, basically, mm. I don't speak Italian. Um, but the Italians are very difficult. My girlfriend speaks Italian quite well. And she's also blind, but we just struggle because they point and wave their hands all the time. <laughs> and pointing is not that helpful, of course. Yeah. So, yeah, I like the food and the history, but I'm not, not too keen on the people. <laughs> and I, I thought I found Armenia very difficult to get around. Um, mm -hmm. Armenia to south of Georgia, mm. um, and there's not a lot of tourists, so it's very difficult to sort of network and speak to people, find people who speak English, and find people who can or help me get to the next place. Um, so that was a difficult country. Um, and then I went to somewhere called Papua New Guinea. It okay. was absolutely incredible, but that's, that's a country that's off the beaten track. 
Um, mm. Yeah, I spent a day and a night on a boat, sleeping on a, a big canoe. And they have all this, um, called beetle nuts, or betel nuts, and they, it's like tobacco, they chew it and spit it. And they take it from the river, down the river, and then up through the only road in the country, up through the mountains. And I spent a night and a day sleeping on top of these bags with the stars above. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite remarkable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm told they still eat people there, so. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Um, yeah, I've been very lucky and fortunate to visit some amazing countries. Mm -hmm. And then uh, last year, uh, this year, I was lucky enough to um, feed an elephant in uh, in Zambia, in Livingston. That was quite amazing. Very hairy. Um, yeah. And then, of course, I, you know, there's lots of things in England close to home to do as well. You know, go caving and kayaking and rafting. And, walking. I did a bungee jump in uh, Middlesbrough a few years ago. It was called the Transformer Bridge. That was pretty good. And there's one in Wales I'd like to do. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm getting mindful of the time. So has anybody got any, any other questions that would like to ask Tony really yeah. quick? Feel free to ask anything. Tony, do you suffer from jet lag when you travel all different countries, different time zones? Sorry? Do you suffer from jet lag, like when to travel from different time zones? What is jet lag? Uh, no, no, I don't. You don't? Okay. No, I think it's a myth, personally. Oh, right. And, do you, have a, and do you have a website? We, we yeah, to... I've got a website called TonyTheTraveller.com. I spell <laughs> traveller with, with two L's. <laughs> T-O-N-Y-T-H-E. T R A V E L L E R dot com. And then I also have a Facebook page called Tony T O N Y space T H E space uh, Traveller. And there's a capital T on Tony and a capital T on Traveller. And I also have got a YouTube channel that people can find me on that doing bungee jumps and other stuff. And then if you go on Amazon or any other the ebook websites you'll be able to find my two books available at the moment They're about five pounds each and my first book is also available in the RNIB cat talking book catalogue and braille catalogue ah. yeah, members of that that's good uh, my second book's not available on the catalogue unfortunately because it's an ebook only and I'm just about to publish my third book hopefully just before Christmas oh uh, yeah well, you certainly had a, a fulfilled life up to now. Let's hope it continues. Sorry? Let's hope your life continues as good as it's been up to now. Yeah? Because yeah. you've, you've had a good life up to now. Yes. Yeah, you, can't, you, can't, you can't say you've been bored. <laughs> no, no. Hopefully I've not bored anyone. No. Oh, no, you've not bored us. <laughs> oh, gosh, no. It's been wonderful. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, oh, oh, thank you. Yeah, well, you know, it's about getting out there and having a go in it, you know. <laughs> I've done things I didn't like and I've done things I like. It's just about having a go and yeah. I do it because I love it and I'm very lucky. Yeah, yeah. Do, you, do you always have somebody with you and you're on your own quite a lot of time? No, I travel by myself. Oh, yeah. I sometimes take my girlfriend if she's good. But yeah. I travel by myself. I want the freedom. I travel with people before, and you've got to compromise. And yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, I want to do this this morning. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. When you're by yourself, you've got the freedom. When you want, you know. Yeah. You've got the flexibility to go yeah. where you want. It's, it's not so bad with my girlfriend because. I kind of like her, but yeah, I've traveled with other people. It's oh, nah, it's too uh, much of a hassle. Oh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I itched that from Leyland where we live to uh, Saint Tropez in France. Me and my mate, and he were a pain. He can you know, I'm I'm saying, come on, we'll go. Here. No, no, I don't want to. I don't want to. Good, yeah. they're hard work, aren't they? They're hard work when you've got somebody else that you have to think of. Yeah. I say, you wake up one morning and think, oh, we're going here today, and 
you know, you're by yourself, you can do it. Yeah. But someone it. else, you got. Yeah. Well, you've only got yourself to console, haven't you? Yeah. Have you ever yeah. got into anywhere? Have you ever, you've talked about difficulty getting into countries. Have you ever had difficulty getting into a place because you had a V, because you've got a stamp in your passport from somewhere else? I know, for example, uh, there's, oh, there's always Cuba. a problem between Israel and Jordan. If you had a Jordanian stamp, you couldn't go into Israel. This yeah, time. that's right, yeah. Um, not, uh, not Jordan, but yeah, it's Israel. And if you get an Israel stamp, um, you can't go to some of the African countries. Cause, oh, right, well, that's worth bearing in yeah, mind. Yeah, they, they don't like the Jews and stuff. Um, yeah, so um, I got, I've been banned from going to the States. <laughs> Because uh -huh. I've been to Sudan. Oh. Uh, well, I haven't been banned, but I tried to get an Esther last year to go to the States. This online thing, and they wouldn't grant it me because I said I put on the form I've been to Sudan and that's considered a terrorist or whatever, something stupid. Oh. So then I tried it again with my other passport and no. Uh, I don't know. I, I just have to wait until I get a new passport and try again. Uh. But you, get, you get issues like that, yeah. When you're trying to visit every country in the world. In, um, some dodgy countries. Uh, but, um, you records if you had a, a brand new passport with no stamp in it. So they wouldn't have your records if you went with a brand new passport now to America. They wouldn't have your records, would they? Because they, they, there's no passport. Well, everything's today. online, so they possibly would. But ah. uh, yeah, that's the thing. I can get around it with a new passport and. Just fill the form out. Um, so, yeah, and there are issues with it, the UK as well. Apparently, you know, Syria could be an issue. I've not been there yet. Um, so, we just have to see. But, uh, yeah. That's the politics. That's what it is. Yeah, it's, it's the politics of travellers and hassle. Um, Cuba. You when I went to Cuba, when I went to well, sorry. I say you've got to be aware of it. There's a lot of people not aware of no you know, politics can no. cause problems. Really, no, lots planet. of problems. It's like when I went to Cuba. Um, went to Cuba in 2004 from Mexico. So when I yeah. came back from, I no. didn't get I didn't get a stamp for Cuba. It was yeah. put on a piece put on a piece of paper. And when I left the yeah. country, the piece of paper was taken, and I got rid of everything that had anything I um, connected me of being to Cuba. But when I went right. into the US, right, things yeah, things like that. Things like, I mean, that's got not much, that's so much of an issue now, but yeah, there's certain countries, you know, lots of countries at war with each other or at war with themselves. So, yeah, there are issues. <laughs> but that's the challenge of it. <laughs> okay, well, I'd like to, to thank you for coming along, Tony. Yeah, Pleasure. Really interesting. I think everybody's enjoyed it. I'm enjoying it. Absolute pleasure. Have me back anytime you want. Yeah, no problem. That's an inspiration. Uh, look forward to meeting you when we eventually go to Peru. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, are you going to Peru with him? He's coming yeah, to Peru. Just, just for, yeah, just for a weekend. No, no. Yeah, there's oh. Inca Trail. Just going for a little walk, aren't we, Tony? I think. <laughs> a little walk. Or we walk up a mountain. They've had a lot of bad weather there, haven't they, lately? <laughs> or is it oh, yeah, we're not going this time of year. <laughs> yeah, this is the winter, so uh, we're hopefully going in April 20... 26, 2060, is it, James? Something like that, yeah, I think so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But yeah, yeah, hopefully everything will be all sorted out and we'll, we'll get there, so. Yeah. And once again, thanks thanks a lot for joining us, Tony. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, been, it's been, been a pleasure having you again. Um, no worries. And, and we'll, we'll catch up soon. Yeah. So thanks just let so everybody much, know. Tom. Yeah, if any, any of you want to get in touch with me, you can do it through my website. There's a link if you want, so feel free. Yeah. On Facebook, of course. Cheers. Okay. okay. All right. so Have a next, good, uh... next week, we're, we're back again at two o'clock next week. And um, like I said, we've got uh, Adam and Mike from Lancashire Wildlife Trust. They're coming to, to give us a talk about all sorts of different things uh, and ways that nature and wildlife... Yeah, that'd be good. Well yeah, I'll, tune in. I'll get in for that if... Um... So yeah, Jesus, just that, just use that, the same link, Tony. Join join it's us. The eleventh. Welcome. It's the eleventh, isn't it? Yeah. It's the eleventh, yeah. yeah. So it's the same link that you've used for this one, uh, and that's the same for everybody. If you just use the same link, um, yeah. 
and any right. sessions we do, it's the same link as well. So for Andrew's talking text sessions, cheers. Same link yeah. as well. So okay. Okay, so thank you. Say thanks to everyone. Yeah, have a good weekend, guys. Bye. Bye. Cheers, bye. 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 bye.